if you came here today to look at an EK-43, this is the EK-43 short, and we're just going to run through this entire grinder, try to demystify it for you. Um, we're going to start by removing the adjustment knob. The adjustment knob has two set screws. They are three millimeter, and if you loosen them enough, that knob will slide right on off. Then we're going to remove the face plate. I like to take the face plate off, kind of, you know, support it so it doesn't go cockeyed. Just, you don't want to bend a screw or anything like that. It can happen. And so, okay, so we removed the face plate. And I just want to show you, there is a grub screw at about the, what is that, 430 or so position. And that can be used to tighten the spindle so that it has a little tension on it in case you're having a problem with dial drift. Face plate off and out of the way. Now you can pull the shear plate. And with just a little bit of, you know, a little bit of pull on there, you should be able to slide the rotary carrier, which is also called a pre-breaker, off of the shaft. The shear plate connects the pre-breaker and the shaft, and it's the weak point. If you hit something very hard, that point is intended to break and save you from doing more expensive damage. The K43 burrs are 98 millimeter. They are good for 13 to 15,000 pounds. Now that's a significant amount of maybe in there. So if you're using it for espresso, it's going to be a little less. If you're using it on really dark roasted coffee, it might be a little bit more. So on the EK-43 burrs, uh, there is not a rotary and a stationary burr, so you can install them uh, without having to worry about which position which one goes in. Um, there is an alignment tool available which does help if you are using the EK-43 for uh, espresso. So when it comes to using a puller, if you have to use a puller to get the pre-breaker off, there are pullers that have bolts. Uh, Malconig sells a puller um, and it comes with the bolts that fit in there. However, if you use a steering wheel puller or something like that, the threads are the same thread as the screws that hold the burrs in, but those screws are not long enough, so you would have to source some longer screws. Okay, just to uh, finish pulling some stuff out of here, if you have a long set of needle nose, you can pull out the distance pushing. This is what the pre-breaker presses against. And way back in there, there's a spring. And often you can just tilt the grinder forward or run the grinder and the spring will spin out a little bit and you can grab it. Okay, for this next part, I have uh, brought up a little mat and laid the grinder on its back. Uh, you can see here is the spout. It's got these little barrels, screws, and springs. And you give it a good little bit of shake. That helps, you know, break the, uh, the static cling so that all the grinds will fall into your bag. Also, there is this device right here that I'm moving, but not removing. It is a static strip. It's a piece of metal that runs down usually the back left side and goes up and takes a 90 degree angle and is held by one of the four bolts that holds the spout on against the metal of the aluminum grinding chamber. That allows it to kind of pull the static electricity down. It doesn't really get rid of it, but by pulling it down, it helps pull the coffee down. That is why you have such low retention. Um, you can often tell when this is broken because you will start to spray coffee more and you will see it adhere to the grinder body more. 
Uh, just don't forget that in the winter time, when the temperature drops below freezing and the humidity uh, dries out of the air, uh, static will increase and there's really nothing that you can do about that. Now you see I have turned the grinder upside down. Um, I removed, previously removed to make it a little faster, the two Phillips head screws which hold on the bottom plate on the EK43. This is kind of a newer addition in the last year or so. Um, if you have an older grinder, you will need to use a 5mm hex or allen key. And there are two screws that allow you to remove the entire foot plate. But since we have the newer version, we're going to go ahead and it, we will expose the bottom plate. And you'll see there's a wiring harness. And if you can see down in there, there are, there is an on and an off button. Um, and the on button is wired two red wires. The off button is wired a red and a putty wire. And we'll show you those a little bit closer here in a minute. So I have disconnected the wiring harness and pulled the on and off micro switches out of their mounts on the actual physical buttons. That allows you to see there's not much else in there. However, there are the on and off buttons and they have uh, four holes on these little clasps and the micro switches have four uh, dots and you have to get them all lined up if one of them is out of place, then when you go to mash the switch, it won't come on. Okay, you can see we've, uh, we've moved the grinder out of the way and we have the base plate out here. We're going to take a quick look at the micro switches, the on and the off. Um, take pictures when you take stuff apart and do some labeling. So in case things come apart, you know where everything goes. Uh, we're not going to go into the specific way everything is wired. We're just going to run you through the anatomy of the grinder. Okay, so on and off micro switches, contactor, uh, start capacitor. It's a smaller capacitor, but it has a 550 UF. This is the operating capacitor. It is 50 UF. This is the over limit. If the grinder were to pull or call for more amps than the over limit is rated, that would pop and save you from doing any motor damage. Put everything back together and plugged the grinder in and tested it and it came on, but it would not shut off, which is pretty common, especially on a short model of an EK43. The uh, motor harness wires, the on-off wires and the capacitors kind of mesh together a little bit and you have to be careful. So when I put it back on, it wasn't exactly right. I had to take it apart again, put that bottom switch back on the way it should be, plug the grinder back in, and now we have on. And will it turn off? Yes, we also have off. Okay. So next thing we're going to look at on the EK43 is there is a centrifugal switch that lives in the back. Um, if you're in a really dusty environment, um, sometimes after a period of time, that switch, it has two little contacts on it and it builds up scars. And those scars prevent it from energizing everything correctly. So uh, occasionally it has to be replaced. And the description of the job is fairly intimidating. We are going to take the front grind chamber off. We are going to take the back plate off. Um, that is where the centrifugal switch is attached. And while we have that out, we will look at the, uh, the parts of the motor. Before I start this job, one of the things that I like to do is, uh, this grinder's been through a little bit, so it doesn't matter if I put a mark on here, but normally I say find a place where you can't see a mark. And I draw a line between the body and the grind chamber and the body and the back plate. And that way when I go put everything back together, they line up exactly like they were. 
do this, we are going to start by unplugging the grinder and taking or loosening rather the seven millimeter nuts. There are usually acorn nuts on the front. Sometimes you'll find them on the back. And there's a rod that runs all the way through the motor housing. It's a seven millimeter on the head of that rod as well. It just takes a minute. These bolts should not, acorn nuts rather, should not be extremely tight. Okay, sorry, that one was in a tough position. Okay, so now we have the rods loose. Oops, watch out, there are little washers and such that can go flying. And they come in handy for holding those acorn nuts in place. But once we have the rods out, then a little trick I like to use, I find it easier than trying to pry the back off because of basically paint. So this is a soft rubber mallet and I typically pop the back off and sometimes the plate will actually fall off. Uh, it's connected with some wires and in some cases like this the plate is actually uh, a little stuck on the rear bearing but that's not too hard to get off. Do that next. So we're gonna go ahead and pull that front grind chamber off. It also has a wavy pressure spring that sits in there. And then we're going to get the uh, bearing out of that back plate. So move all our stuff out of the way over here. Uh, one method I've come to like, and it usually works not the first time every time is I push back on the, the shaft and then I pull it forward like snatching a tooth and it snatches this bearing out of a seat in the back and if you'll notice when we pulled this out there's also a bearing on the front which rests in this seat on the grind chamber Next I have the rotary out. I find oh, there it is. usually the end of my nice little rubber handle right here and you have to watch out because there is a centrifugal switch back there but I put it in the bearing hole and kind of pop it out. Uh, we have the rotary out. Now it's time to pop the back right back off. I use the soft rubber end of my mallet and just kind of push and I was putting that right in the center where that bearing goes being very careful not to bung my centrifugal switch this is the centrifugal switch little horseshoe thing here it's got two contacts I don't know if you can see that two contacts right in here and when it comes together it energizes the coils there is a spade bit that connects on one part and the other part when you go to replace it you will have to cut a wire and use a butt connector or some other type of wire connection uh, I prefer the butt connectors because they keep everything nice and neat uh, a wire uh, nut often just kind of seems too bulky and you do have to be concerned with uh, how things go back together because when the rotor goes to spinning, if things aren't right, it can pull some wires and do, do some damage. Okay, we pushed the grinder over there. We're going to look at the rotor real quick. I already showed you the front and rear bearings rest in the seats uh, that I've shown you over there. 
Then there's the impeller. The impeller is actually capable of moving on the shaft uh, if you're not careful. And when you put it back together, it uh, can hit stuff, and that's not good. So you want to, A, make sure it doesn't move. And if when you put everything back together, it's hitting something, then you need to uh, basically push it on the shaft up to, it almost looks like an etched line. But it's really more like where the polished part of the shaft stops and uh, it's it's rather distinct so if you pay attention that shouldn't be a problem so looking at the rotor i already showed you front and rear bearings which allow it to spin um, just to say you want to be careful with these pieces right here you don't want to have to uh, Try to reassemble them if they come apart. They're not real easy. But the main thing to worry about is this impeller is press fit and it can move. And if it moves out of place, there's it almost looks like an etched line. But what it really is is uh, where the polished part of the shaft stops and there's this like kind of hazy part of the shaft. That's where it goes. And you want to be careful not to... Um, move the impeller or let this roll off the table um, and if you have to reposition the impeller I have had good luck using my soft mallet and a large adjustable so that I can have something pressing on there and I can either you know tap it down tap it this way or, or tap it up here we are ready for a little reassembly yeah, I like to tuck my wires down like they were before just to keep everything out of the way make sure everything's not getting pinched line up my marker line that I put on here during disassembly then check that my impeller is up to that line Slide the rotor into the stator. The rotor is this part that rotates. The stator is the, the piece with the windings in it. Okay. So then, you know, also I think it's worth mentioning there's a good bit of lube on most of these parts, so I'm not going to worry about it right now, but I do recommend lubing the inside of the bearing seat on the rear and on the front uh, whenever you're reassembling. All right, we line up our, we kind of line up our marks. I've had pretty good luck hugging it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it needs a little nudge. Now, I know that didn't look sexy, but sometimes you can just squeeze them and they'll go right back together. Sometimes you, you know, use a little, a little bit of that. Okay, once you have that kind of pressed back together, I recommend giving the shaft a spin, and I'm actually spinning it counter to what it normally does. So spin it counterclockwise. If it sounds really quiet, you don't hear any audible scrubbing, then you've got everything lined up pretty nice. Next thing to do is to reinstall the long rods. If those marks did their job, then we should be able to get right in there. There we go. Sometimes you have to do a little wiggle. Okay. We're going to go ahead and put our washers and acorn nuts on. And we'll be right back. Okay. We've tightened up our acorn nuts on our long bolts. And that actually helps 
finished doing the job of pulling everything together. And uh, now it's time to test the grinder before we put everything back in the grind chamber. Just because uh, it gives us an opportunity to go back in if we need to without having to disassemble everything. Plug the grinder in, we have a nice on and a nice off. And then you kind of want to listen. It's a very quiet running EK43. You will notice EK43s have a little release. If you hear that, all right, everything sounds pretty good. We'll move on to reassembling the grind chamber. Next part, I laid the grinder on its back. You don't need to do that when you do this. I kind of did it so you can see better. Okay, so I like to line the slot and the shaft up horizontally. Then we're going to stick the uh, pressure spring in there. Then we're going to stick the distance bushing back in. Then we're going to put our pre-breaker on, but uh, I like to add a little bit of lube inside the pre-breaker before I reinstall. Particularly on an older grinder, this helps take up any amount of space that um, has worn in. Uh, on an older grinder, you'll sometimes get a little noise on startup. That's what is described as pre-breaker wobble and a viscous sanitary lube will prevent that from happening. And I just like to put a little bit more. I like to see enough in there to take up any space. Okay, so horizontal slot, horizontal slot. Slide them together. You can see the excess lube starting to come out the opposite end. Then we're going to stick our shear plate in. And I also like to put a little lube on the two leading edges. And what that does when you are installing it is just in case there is any play it keeps that shear plate from rattling. Um, okay. Now we're going to reinstall the face plate. And when I reinstall the face plate, I like to get one side started, actually both sides started. And then I like to put it on kind of evenly. So while I put one side one side in I press the other side in so they actually went in very even and then all you got to do is tighten up so once I have the faceplate on securely then I like to run the spindle all the way in what that's doing is can't go any further the burrs are touching okay so now I just go a quarter or a half turn off and it gives you room to start the grinder and then calibrate. If the uh, spindle is too far back, which sometimes people have a tendency to play with the spindle when they have the face plate off, then the pre-breaker can rub against the inside of the face plate and it'll create a, a nasty scarring and it sounds terrible but it doesn't do any damage that would uh, hurt the grinder unless you keep running it that way. All right, we're going to put the knob back on and calibrate real quick. So we will get the knob on there, spin it all the way over to the fine position, plug the grinder in, and then remember we backed off a good quarter to half a turn after we ran that spindle all the way in. So we're going to start the grinder and then we're going to hold that in the fine position, move the spindle clockwise 
to you here metal on metal that is the burrs touching if you're using the grinder for espresso you want your calibration to be very tight if you're using the grinder to do a french press or filter coffee you can open up the calibration a little bit you have some room there one way that you can check for a tight calibration is you put it on zero the finest setting and just push in on the faceplate there's enough play there that you should be able to make it squeal on a tight calibration Everybody stay safe, uh, take care of yourselves out there, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Take care of your equipment.